as Lana said, my name is Anna Sangster, and I have the distinct pleasure this morning of being your moderator uh, in conversation with Ms. Lisa Menning, who's joining us very early this morning from Seattle. So thank you, Lisa, for the early morning. Lisa is currently team lead for vaccine demand and behavioral sciences, working in the Department of Immunization at the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. Lisa brings almost 20 years of progressive experience in global health, social and behavior change, communications, community engagement and advocacy, and has experience working in the nonprofit, public and private sectors. She has spent the last decade working in immunization and prior to that worked on HIV and AIDS and non-communicable diseases. In her current role at WHO, Lisa manages a program of work that is focused on confidence and uptake of vaccination, as well as addressing vaccine hesitancy. Her focus is on developing normative guidance and supporting tools that draw on the latest evidence and experience from the social and behavioral sciences, providing technical support to regions and countries and collaborating with partners and civil society. I've had the great pleasure of working with and getting to know Lisa over the past year and her passion, although she doesn't always like that word, and dedication to this subject area are clear to see and inspiring for all others, including IFA, who do work in this space. Lisa, it's such a pleasure to have you with us this morning. And to kick off today's conversation, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you first became interested in the field of vaccination, and more specifically, the intersection of vaccination and behavioral sciences. Over to you, Lisa. Thanks so much, Anna, for the introduction and, and for the invitation to, to join you this morning. Um, it, it's really a pleasure. Um, and so really um, what shaped my career path in many ways is an interest in social change and, and social movements. And that combined with an interest in science and, and public health. And um, being a, a young activist, Really, it was very formative for me. And uh, throughout my career, I've worked in, in public health with a focus on equity and access to health and um, medicines and vaccination, um, particularly for those who are um, most disadvantaged. And uh, I've also studied um, medical sciences and, and social psychology. So mm -hmm. in my work, I really... I, um, a diverse range of strategies from communications to thinking about social change and social norms, but also what shapes behaviors as well. Um, and in the last decade or so, I've worked in immunization, um, which was really just something I stumbled into, but it has been absolutely fascinating. And I, I think the, the um, success of immunization and its potential, even in the future, it has just so much for um, the, the health and, and well-being of, of people on this planet. So it, it's really an exciting place to be. Thanks so much, Lisa. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. And I, I want to kind of talk a little bit about um, COVID right off the bat, because I think it's an important kind of component of this conversation. There's been an incredible focus on immunization during the COVID-19 pandemic. So can you tell us generally about the state of immunization programs today, kind of in the COVID world, post-COVID, and how they've fared and, and kind of what's the difference you're seeing in the adult vaccination programs and, and the child and adolescent as well? Yeah, thank you, Anna. That's a great question. And there's so much to unpack there. Just firstly, I've been thinking about COVID and the pandemic and the role of vaccination, just so absolutely central. And there's never been such attention and, and interest and information available about vaccination as what we've seen in, in the last few years. Um, at the same time, um, because of COVID and the disruptions on health systems and health services, um, we have seen that um, childhood vaccination has slipped behind. And there have been um, a lot of children, um, particularly in 2020 and 2021, many children who missed um, doses of vaccination, either their first dose or the completion of their childhood vaccination schedule. And when we pair data that we saw for, say, 2019 compared to 2020, um, we saw that there was a huge increase in the number of children that missed down on vaccination. And we were just about to see data come through for 2021. And hopefully we're starting to turn the curve back there. But in really, really talking about these are large numbers where 
um, over these recent years, uh, 25 million children have, have missed out on um, essential vaccination. So that's quite critical. And there's now a, a huge effort in the immunisation community identify that the countries and the, the communities where these children are located and identify the reasons why they were missed and what kinds of disruptions or other causes this was due to and then to take the, the necessary actions to, to catch up these kids. Um, and, and there's a campaign that's rolling out this year to, to focus on that effort. Um, but at the same time, for, for COVID vaccination and all of the added opportunities that that created for um, vaccination of adults and, and older adults, those who are most at risk with co comorbidities or those who would be most at risk for, for COVID, um, that also created really important new connections um, for those populations and uh, connecting them to health services and to vaccination. And I think there's so much there that we can build on in future as well. Thanks so much, Lisa. I wonder too, I, I know that, uh, you know, we certainly see in the work that we do, there's a real lack of kind of um, data on coverage rates for, for adults. And that's, you know, we see much more <clears throat> comprehensive coverage rates for, for childhood vaccinations. Um, would you expect kind of based on what you're seeing in the trends for childhood that that would be a similar trend for adult vaccination that there's there's been this kind of, you know, unfortunately, almost a regression despite kind of the increased uh, awareness around vaccination through COVID? Yeah, so absolutely. And I think that, you know, whilst we've seen, uh, you know, as a, due to the uh, disruptions and um, just ways in which the health system was really stretched through COVID, you know, um, many children didn't miss out on these. But at the same time, like you're saying, for, for adult vaccination and really this expansion of our focus across the entire life course uh, for vaccination, and I think that has created um, uh, just connections and, and an understanding of the importance of vaccination for adults, not only for um, COVID vaccination, but for influenza vaccines and others. And you know, the data that we have on um, COVID vaccination and then where and how many um, adults have gotten vaccinated for, for COVID, that is really substantial. And countries have incredible data systems, digitized data systems that have been developed thanks to all this in attention and investments in COVID. So having better data is really a starting point too for being able to guide our planning and strategies um, in, in effective ways. Absolutely. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I want to talk a little bit about low uptake and, and what, what do you know normally about kind of the reasons for, for low uptake? Yeah, thank you. And I think this is really a, a foundational question in, in our work in immunization, which is really in trying to achieve increased uptake, we really need to know why there's low uptake in specific settings. And we know those reasons for low uptake are often very context specific and specific to different vaccines, whether it's for, for childhood vaccination or HPV vaccination for adults or, or older adults and, and COVID, et cetera. So it's very context specific and often very specific to vaccination uh, per vaccine. Um, but then we need to really look across a range of drivers and, and consider not only people's attitudes or, or confidence in, in vaccination, but other factors such as norms and, and influences from um, families, friends, other local influential leaders like a religious leader or community leader. Um, and, and typically people's attitudes and, and these norms that, that influence are um, contribute to shaping people's motivations or intentions. And this is their, their desire to want to get vaccinated. But then in the end, their ability to carry through with that and, and, and actually get vaccinated is fundamentally shaped by their ability to access services and the quality of those services and the affordability of those services. And it's these access-related factors, these practical factors based on the data that we have, um, these seem to be in, in many places 
um, the, the main reason why there's low uptake is that these practical factors get in the way and that in many um, places, the majority of people do understand the importance of vaccination and are motivated. Um, and there are positive norms. We, we do know that really in many ways, um, the vaccination is the most eff effective health intervention that keeps keeps us healthy throughout life. And it's sometimes these um, gaps in service quality and, and accessibility of services, um, particularly in, in low-income settings that, that really do hamper uh, uptake. And that having good data across all of these reasons then enables us to uh, design and, and implement the necessary tailored and targeted strategies. So Lisa, I already have a question kind of rolling in here that's that's related, so I'm going to kind of bring it up now. Um, but, you know, you talked about kind of behavioral science that helped me to develop tools. And I wonder, there's a question here from Shmuel, who joins us every week. Thanks, Shmuel. Um, and it's really about how behavioral sciences can support the improvement of accessibility, um, for particularly those that are often kind of left behind um, or, or kind of, you know, either in marginalized communities or, or just harder to reach. How, how is the work you're doing um, and, and kind of what those tools look like um, to kind of help support that increased accessibility? Mm, that, that's really <laughs> a, a great question because what we know from the evidence is, is that we can increase people's knowledge and, and attitudes um, related to vaccination. So we can increase people's understanding of um, the importance and benefits and safety of, of vaccination. But that is not enough. That is absolutely necessary. And people, we do want to support informed decision-making and access to accurate information, but this is not enough for people to actually get vaccinated. So thinking all the way through to behaviours and, and what will shape and drive behaviours and connect people um, to vaccination services is really the main outcome that we need to work towards. So, so this is a great question, which is really about how do we shape those behaviours? And, and there are many strategies for doing that, which really relate to uh, using little um, prompts or reminders, sending someone a text message that basically says, um, your next dose of vaccination is reserved and available for you um, next week. Don't forget to book an appointment. So these, um, and this is just an example of a kind of reminder and prompt and a behavioral intervention. And then, of course, assuming that person has the ability to get to that point of service and can afford that and it's it's convenient. The, the ease and convenience of actually getting to vaccination is really that last final step, but most important step. So there, there are a lot of strategies that we can employ that help to bring um, the, the service and the delivery of vaccination closer to people. And, and we really also cannot rely on people to go out of their way to really make a huge effort um, to, to, you know, take a half day off work or, or take a day off work to go and get vaccinated. And it, it's really in many ways the, the responsibility of the health system and the health sector to understand populations and, and really um, design these services in such a way that it's, it's as convenient as possible for, for people to get vaccinated. Absolutely, sir. Dovetailing off of that a bit, what are you what are you seeing as kind of some of the main barriers to, you know, ensuring kind of that accessibility and ensuring kind of we we reach those most at risk? What are what are kind of some of the big challenges that uh, that you face in your work? You know, it's it's important um, to really think about what these different challenges are in different settings, and to to have good data to really understand what those challenges are at a local level. And it's, it's incredibly diverse, but um, some of the main reasons, speaking very generally and globally as, as, as a starting point, but some of the main reasons and main challenges that we face, firstly, do relate to um, a, a lack of information. And particularly during COVID and, and for COVID vaccination um, for, for, for adults, um, we've seen just also, un unfortunately, a huge amount of misinformation related to COVID vaccines. And, um, and, and that has 
uh, or, or even disinformation that, that has come from bad actors, shall we say. So that, that is a challenge in, in really making sure that people, if they do have questions, they can access accurate, reliable information from the right sources as well, so sources that they would trust. So, so that is just, you know, one challenge to, to overcome in, in many respects. Um, another challenge is also thinking about the sources of information and, and who's most trusted and, and particularly the role of health workers there. Because in many settings, a, a connection to a trusted health worker is um, the, the most, um, you know, that recommendation from a health worker towards vaccination is um, a real an investment to make in, in a health system and in training and supporting health workers. But that in many countries, often, unfortunately, that is left a little bit behind. So making those investments in equipping and supporting health workers to be well-trained and, and empowered to speak for immunisation in, in, in well-informed ways, that is absolutely critical and a challenge to overcome in some places. And, and then the last challenge really is, as, as I was saying, related to just accessibility of quality services and in a way the proximity of those services and even that experience on site. And in a lot of cases in, in some countries, um, there, there are long waiting times for, for vaccination or the, um, the facility is just not well equipped, not set up. Um, and there's just been infrastructure that's underfunded in, in many ways. And, and that unfortunately um, means that in, in various ways that actual experience on site of a vaccination is, is not always an entirely um, positive thing. And, and what that means is um, people might be less likely to return for vaccination again in future if their experience of that that entire journey to vaccination from you know that that affording a bus ticket to the time it takes the waiting time that the way that they've been treated you know if they did have some questions and concerns how those concerns were heard and addressed um, all of these things really compound and um, it's a lot of investment and attention that's needed in um, understanding all these things and, and um, working through them at a programmatic level. Speaking programmatic level, Lisa, and kind of you, you've highlighted a couple of the barriers and, and, and challenges you're facing. What does it take for programs to be understanding and addressing these kind of barriers? Uh, yeah, I think that... Um, this is often, you know, a kind of a, in a way, a root cause to be able to effectively design programs that um, do achieve high uptake of vaccination. And this is vaccination for any population. So children, adolescents, adults, older adults. And fundamentally, it really starts with programs wanting to um, invest in strategies that um, start by listening and, and really understanding those populations of the, the parents of adolescents, all these older adults and, and listening and, and saying, okay, how do we really truly understand where they're at and their questions and concerns or what makes it difficult for them to get closer to vaccination? So there's actually a, a willingness and, and like a political will almost that's needed as a starting point to, to really invest in the appropriate strategies that start with listening and, and gathering local data to say, well, what are barriers? And, and let's assess all of these barriers that I just described. So not just people's attitudes and knowledge, but the other practical access related barriers that are getting in the way. So we really need that will. We need good planning. Uh, and, and really, this is this often requires a lot of coordination between different partners and different stakeholders. There's a lot to be said about who needs to be involved and how these different uh, um, collaborators need to come together and, and share information and work together. Um, we need the right investments in these strategies that start with gathering the data to diagnose these reasons why there's low uptake and act on them um, with the right tailored and targeted strategies. And um, there's, there's often just so much more, but those would be the real 
main kind of um, building block to be able to design effective strategies that are in informed by local data and, and not assumptions about these reasons. Absolutely. So speaking about kind of the, the, the importance of collaboration and kind of opportunities for, I think, collaboration and increased interest in, in this space, World Immunization Week is coming up. And I know you've already mentioned briefly, um, you know, the theme, which is the big catch up this year. Um, so just wondering what kind of materials and resources from WHO will be available to kind of support World Immunization Week? And, and, and what do you see in terms of kind of opportunities that that, that week provides for kind of furthering mm -hmm. this conversation? Yeah, and it's really um, you know, it's such a, an important moment for collective action, um, World Immunization Week. It's an annual, um, in a way, celebration of immunization um, every year at the end of April. And like you're saying, and Anna, thank you, thank you for coming back to this. Uh, so, th so this year the theme is the big catch up, and and it really is. Um, a, a, an entry point for thinking about where there are children or adolescents or even adults who've missed a dose of vaccination in, in the last few years and really thinking about how we work together to connect the, these various groups to vaccination. And, and so um, to support um, the entire community. And when I speak for the community, this is the immunization community, but also the health sector and, and other groups like the International Federation of Aging and, and many others. So any kind of organization that has an interest in the health and well-being of, of people um, have, uh, this is an opportunity to, to be involved and to, to speak for immunization and to, to look in their communities and talk to people and, and see what people think and feel about vaccination. Um, are there questions and concerns? And are there people or, or children who've missed a dose of vaccination and to really figure out why and, and then work together to, to find solutions to, to connect these people to vaccination. So to support all of these various activities, throughout World Immunization Week in the last week of April, um, WHO and partners are making available an entire kit uh, of different kinds of materials and, and assets that can adapt and, and use in their local context relevant to, to the, ro the role they play and the type of work they normally do and, and the opportunities they see to be able to speak for immunization and, and just have conversations uh, and make connections um, related to immunization. So um, we're making available a package that's really a, a day or two away from being launched. And, and this just consists of messaging, but posters and templates and social media tools and, and many other things, uh, conversation guides and uh, little tips and job aids for health workers even. And so there's a package of different tools for different purposes and for different kinds of stakeholders or actors to be using that just give them a little bit of a head start or a starting point for um, sharing information, these conversations, et cetera. And, and we really hope that um, these can be adapted and used um, in, in various ways in communities in particular um, and, and that it, it creates an, an opportunity um, to be involved at, at this point in time. And um, we can talk a little bit more uh, about what some of those tools might be and, and how they can be used. And I'd be really happy to hear from you, Anna, and, and members here on the call today as to any ideas or questions that you would have as well about um, you know, contributions that, that can be made and how we can support you in that. Yeah, Lisa, that's great. I'm 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 looking forward to those materials myself, and and very much uh, I'm I'm sure the group would would love to get their hands on those when they're released as well. I think uh, you know certainly from our perspective, it's it's great that they've been I think uh, created in a way that allows for some of that adaptation, so that we can kind of tailor it to our own message and make sure it resonates within our own communities and constituencies. So very much looking forward to kind of further engaging with those those materials and and continuing this conversation. There's a few conversations questions that are now rolling in. So I want to take the opportunity to come to some of our, our uh, audience today. Um, great comment here from, from Brendan and probably a few steps back, but Brendan, if you would like to ask your question and uh, we can add a bit of context just so we're, we're back on the same page. 
Yeah, it's, it's actually done here in Ireland where the vaccination is done through the schools, which is a good idea because uh, if people have to go for a vaccine, then perhaps that's, that's a barrier in one way. And during COVID, the pharmacists were brilliant uh, giving out the, the, the vaccine. Now, the GPs were also. So it can be done. And one of the things that comes to mind is in France, the children's allowance, it's, it's, a, it's an allowance for children, that is actually brought to the house, which means that people don't have to go for it. One thing it does, it creates employment. There's someone employed to actually go and do that. So the solutions are there if people want to just accept them. And it, it, it was said earlier about listening. While you're talking, you're not listening. And that is one lesson for all politicians. Thank you. Thanks, Brandon. I think, and I think, Lisa, if I can interpret, right, like, I think the, the, the comment here is really about, um, you know, do you see value and is, is, is that a priority for WHO, this kind of idea of vaccination gateways and, and increasing kind of the, the space and vaccinators, you know, uh, pharmacists, again, we've seen, um, mm -hmm. they've provided a tremendous support through COVID. Um, and really, there's there's still vaccines that are available that you know pharmacists are not able to administer, and there's there's those issues with uh, you know where are they store, where are they delivered. So is that something that's on kind of the the forefront of WHO's mind? Yeah, absolutely, and and I think that um, it's really great. You know, th thank you, Brendan, for coming in with that and and sharing your, your perspectives there, and you know um, this point about you know really. Um, you know, going to the, the target populations and, and and bringing vaccination to people where they're at, in, you know, for, for adolescents in, in schools or in the community, you know, in a pharmacy or, you know, we, we really, our, our work at HO is really primarily um, focused on low middle income settings and settings in, in Africa and Asia and um, you know, outreach uh, delivery strategies is, is where there are vaccinators who go into the community and might go door to door, or they might have a, a vaccination day at you know the the local town square or um, at a, a well trusted venue, a, a local um, uh, you know a religious um, you know association, a, a centre. Um, so really bringing vaccination to people in their community um, at a trusted location, um, you know, it is really, um, you know, it just reduces the, the friction and the added effort that, that is required on um, adults and, and, and parents. And delivery through pharmacies as, as well is a, a great opportunity for, for some vaccines, um, depending on the, the storage, the handling, um, the administration of the vaccine, the, the target population. And there are many countries indeed, for example, for the influenza vaccination for adults, they do um, deliver and make that available in pharmacies. And that the convenience of that is, is enormous. And, and it, in many ways, as Brendan's saying, it relies on a lot of political commitment to invest in the training, the the logistics of actually, you know, having the 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 coal equipment, the fridges, and or other information available. So that there's a variety of things that, that need to come together. But it, it really starts by understanding the population, listening to their needs, and and designing these services and strategies in ways that, that meet the local community needs. That's so great, Lisa, thank you so much. We've got a great question from Cynthia here too. Cynthia, would you like to come forward and ask your question? Yes, thank you, Lisa. This is really a wonderful presentation today and dialogue, but I was just wondering about kind of the current state of accessibility and affordability for less developed countries. And then that also backs up to where 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 things are with the whole pharmaceutical industry who manufactures the vaccine. Yeah, Cynthia, that's an excellent question, and um, uh, you know, I, th I think the, the the topic of equity um, after COVID is really top of mind. That um, you know, for for COVID vaccination. 
um, never before has, has there been such a, uh, a huge investment and collaboration in, in the development of vaccination or vaccine that um, has just, you know, really become available in such, uh, in such a rapid way. So, you know, I think vaccine research and development and manufacturing has come a huge way forward in, in recent years in many ways, thanks to all this attention and investment and collaboration that, that happened with COVID. But unfortunately, um, the equity of being able to equally distribute those vaccines around the world, everywhere, at the same time, w- was not there. And in, in many ways, there were other kinds of um, political and economic constraint, if I can say that, that really held back the um, equal um, access to COVID vaccinations uh, at a really critical time. And um, I- indeed, I think that um, in future, one of our main challenges globally, when we think about um, access to, to new vaccines or even existing vaccines, is really um, some of these um, considerations that, that underpin equity. And WHO is working um, at the moment with many collaborators and, and many um, entities like Gavi, which is the Global Alliance for Vaccinization, and also um, an entity called CEPI and, and many others to um, build manufacturing capacity in, in low income settings and, and create mm-hmm. hubs in um, Africa or Asia and to create knowledge uh, transfers and to contribute to, to building capacity and adding up that infrastructure so that uh, there's more um, decentralized uh, um, infrastructure ultimately for um, development, uh, research and and manufacturing of vaccination that really truly meet the the needs of of low income settings and future enables us to overcome some of these equity uh, challenges. And that's not to say that all, all the challenges on that front have been overcome. There's still a, a lot of work to, to be done on that front. Um, but I think that there's so much more attention and interest in this topic. And uh, we're, we're making progress, but uh, I think that um, not all the answers are there yet, I have to say. So it's um, really an important space to watch. And I think for... Uh, you know, campaigners and and those who really uh, do play a role in um, advocacy and in communication about uh, equal access to vaccination and affordability of vaccination and uh, ensuring that um, low middle is left behind in future. There's a lot to be done to to continue to work together to um, uh, to to ensure that. Um, we're, we're really uh, um, keeping a focus on, on these efforts in the future. Thanks very much, Lisa. And thanks, Cynthia, for your question. Lisa, the, the two of us have talked in the past about kind of some of the, like you do very international work and, and I think there's some real complexity and nuance to that. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about in your experience, what are some of the kind of uh, the challenges and differences in terms of entry point for conversation around vaccination, um, it, depending on kind of the country you're working in and, and the area you're working in? Mm. And it's a really um, excellent question as to, you know, to, to think about, um, you know, what are the opportunities, what are the ways in, in which we can start a conversation uh, about vaccination? And um, it, it really starts in a way um, with listening. Um, and, and this is, a, a, I guess, a thing that we, we come back to. But uh, before we start a conversation, it, it's perhaps uh, about asking an open question and, and really listening and, and just um, really listening to the conversations that exist already and, and looking out for the information that's already being shared. So I, I would say even before starting a conversation, doing a little bit of groundwork to, to listen, to look out and, and to also just keep an eye out for who's most trusted in a community when it comes to sharing information about vaccination. So who are the people um, that that, um, will be 
um, that we can work to support for them to be at, at the forefront of having these conversations. So I would actually start uh, start start by the listening, the the looking out, and just doing that little bit of quick groundwork to 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 look at the environment um, before starting these conversations. And and then we're well equipped. We're in a place to then be able to say, okay, well, what are the themes that that are emerging now? Like, what questions that people have, or what are the the concerns that that people might have, or who is the right sort that we can work through? Or maybe it's someone in our network, or maybe it's it's anyone here who's online today, or anyone you know who you can work with or work through to equip them. To, to be a, a spokesperson and a champion for vaccination. And so um, once we have this kind of, um, you know, understanding of the context, I guess, um, the, the next step is really then to, to think about, well, what answers do we need? What information do we need? And what sources, where do we go for that information? So how can we be um, better equipped to um, find the right accurate information to then answer those questions and concerns or close any of these information gaps. And, and once we have um, the, the necessary accurate information, we then need to think, okay, who, um, who does this need to come from? So are we the right people to be sharing that? Or are there others in our community that we can support to be sharing that information as well? And we can work together with them. And, and then there are many ways to have these conversations as well. And these can just be like one-to-one -one conversations that start with an open question. Well, like, you know, well, tell me about, you know, what do you think about vaccination or tell me about your concerns or what would it take to bring you closer to, to vaccination? So th this can be one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, but it can also be like a, a community meeting, um, a little webinar, uh, a little, uh, uh, just a, a gathering in your community. I, I would also say that often in the work that you do, there are existing um, uh, platforms, uh, it's a very general word, but there are existing um, mechanisms or activities that you're already doing that, that provide an opening for you to then just weave a little bit more about immunisation into that. Uh, so I would look at um, who you're talking to, um, what you're already doing, and, and just build on that as, as a starting point. And I, I would just add one last quick point on this um, topic about conversations, which is the tone of the conversation as well. And this is really um, equally important because um, sometimes when people might um, have questions or concerns about information um, about vaccination, when they're not really sure, they might have heard some misinformation, or they they might have seen some dis disinformation that that was spread by an anti vaxxer that that's not accurate. But they they're really just trying to like figure this out in a in a well intentioned way, and I think that. Um, the way in which we show respect in these conversations and and care and empathy is also really important. So if someone does um, share a, a concern or a question that is not right, and and they're they're saying, oh well, I've you know there's you know maybe repeating some misinformation uh, about a vaccination, I think that we really need to respond to that in a respectful way without dismissing them um, to, and to really hear where coming from and um, try to address that in, in a way that's very um, care. So um, I think that that hopefully that gives you a little bit of a, a starting point as to, to um, where to create these openings. Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, there's actually a great question that's come in as you've been speaking from, from John, and I think it speaks a bit to the complexity and oftentimes discomfort with these conversations. So John, would you like to come forward and ask your question? Um, speaking from a local uh, standpoint, uh, we had in uh, men's sheds in our communities, uh, people who were uh, knowledgeable, um, clear thinkers, uh, and they had sources of information. They were not 
uh, people uh, following, uh, you know, um, wild theories. Uh, but how 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 could we um, who were depending on uh, public sources of information uh, talk with these people? We tried to do it respectfully, but it became quite divisive mm -hmm. because they had sources uh, that seemed very reputable and um, sources which, in some instances, they claimed were being silenced by uh, authorities. It, it almost became a, a conspiracy theory to, to quiet and quell anything that went against what uh, world leaders and in, in the health field were telling us. Um, uh, we have survived that. And those who were anti-vaxxers and others who followed uh, along and got their vaccinations, um, it has result as we're beginning to emerge from the pandemic, but, um, during that time, it was very divisive. Where do we, mm -hmm. uh, where do we find uh, sources that can confront and debate publicly uh, mm -hmm. things that can be divisive? Uh, is there a platform? Is there a place where those who are for and those who voices that are being raised can debate in a public forum uh, so that uh, the the anti voices are not just overridden; they're dealt with in a public forum, so mm -hmm. that others at the ground level um, can hear both sides debated and 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 come to their own conclusions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thanks, John. Yeah, John, you know. I really, um, this is such a, a complex challenge and I really appreciate you, you raising this. And, um, you know, there were various times throughout the, the COVID pandemic in, in particular where we saw um, a lot of divisive debate and um, polarisation uh, in, in the, the narratives and the information environment about COVID vaccines and maybe even immunisation in, in general. And, um, unfortunately, uh, these people are very vocal and, and loud and, and sometimes influential in the way in which they use narratives and personal stories as, as well to, to, um, to back up their point. And, you know, at the same time, they are often very much a small minority. Um, and I think we do have some, you know, from evidence and experience, some um, general kind of principles, I would say, as to how we can respond. And um, the first thing is to really avoid um, getting into a debate with, with these people. And, and I think that the first step is really to understand who they are and why they are, you know, um, acting in, in such a way and, and spreading this information and really like figure out where they're coming from. So I, I think it it also again starts with just doing a little bit of groundwork to figure out like um, what are the themes and what platforms are they using and who's their audience as well who's actually listening to them and um, so uh, you know having a little bit of a, a scoping and an understanding of the situation and and their motives as well so um, are there motives based on, um, on, you know, the, the possibility that they're trying to promote an alternative product or um, they're, they're trying to, um, uh, you know, raise their own um, uh, prominence in a way um, and, and popularity. So what, what are their interests? Where are they coming from? And, and why is this happening? And I think that having a little bit of this background um, knowledge and insight about all of that and their audience who's listening to them, enables us to then respond accordingly. And I think um, other principles that, that I would also recommend is just to not get into a debate. We should not really, as, as much as possible, we should avoid debating and, and 
um, uh, getting into a, a discussion with with these people where really in the end it's it's not about science and evidence and they're taking a position because they have other interests to promote and that is a situation where unfortunately there's little positive ground to be made and that's potentially only going to add oxygen and and give them further attention give them a platform that they're also seeking so um avoiding debating and you know there's this saying not to feed the trolls I think that's really um, an important kind of um, principle here. Um, and I think at the, at the same time, though, is, is not to directly dismiss these, these people as well and that there is potential to look at their audience and in, work around them to make available accurate information from the most appropriate trusted sources in that community. And, and often it is the, the local um, conversations and local dialogue that, that really will help us to ensure that um, the uh, community has accurate um, information and that it does come from the right people. So th there's not a, a one size fit all solution here and it's not an easy solution at all. And this is absolutely in many ways quite frustrating and, and disruptive and a distraction and uh, it's really a difficult problem, but um, I, I think that uh, we we know a lot about how to to respond here, and there are even lessons from you know other areas like climate change, for example, that we can look at that that have also um, made good progress in um, supporting effective and evidence based accurate dialogue on, on these topics. Thanks very much, Lisa. I think that kind of motive piece is is really interesting and. And I think, you know, COVID in a lot of ways was not unique, but I think we were we were learning with public health professionals a lot of the time. And I think that that created some challenges because I think, you know, even uh, public health advice shifted quickly. And I think that, you know, I, I wonder to what degree you see that as having impacted the vaccine conversation as well. Because I think that was something that I think, you know, certainly Canadians struggled with is that, you know, one day we'd get wear a mask and then the next week it would be like, don't and then yeah. the next week it would be this and and I think it's yeah. staying abreast and, and kind of understanding how that that science works and I think that that's a that that, that was a, certainly a barrier here and wondering yeah. whether you saw that and, and that I think trickled into probably it's fairly insidious isn't it yeah and and Anna, it's such a great point and there's a lot that we can learn to from um, risk communications and and best practice I guess in in the field of risk communications and um, during COVID, uh, particularly in 2021, as in the early phases of the, the rollout of COVID vaccines, it was such a dynamic and complex information environment. And there was a lot of rapidly evolving information um, that was um, being, um, you know, coming to the forefront about these vaccines and their effectiveness, uh, but also various um, safety events. And uh, the, it was just such a complex and rapidly changing information environment. And the ways in which, um, say, political leaders, authorities, and many other, like even scientists, the role of scientists and um, health professionals in sharing information and responding in this environment was absolutely critical. And so best practice from risk communications and evidence on risk communications really gives us a foundation for understanding how to um, work through such a complex and involving um, information environment where things are so dynamic. And some of these principles include um, being transparent and, and really edging that things are changing and we have new evidence that is you know becoming available all the time so that there are just again it's it's the tone it's the respect it's the empathy it's acknowledging that um it really is that people will have questions and concerns that it is uh, a, a difficult time and people are trying to do their best to navigate and, and figure all of this out and it, it's the the values that are also portrayed through these communications are really, really important. And, uh, and I think that uh, 
really trying to, I think, work together with scientists and, and you know, since for, for authorities or other experts or um, organizations to to work with local trusted medical experts and um, and and to speak for um, the latest evidence in a, in a way that's very transparent and acknowledges that things are changing or there are new developments and and uh, the the ways in which we do that in a um, in a transparent, honest, and and respectful way is really important too. too. Thanks so much. I think those are super important points. I'm going to switch tracks a little bit here. We have a great question from Dr. Barrett around kind of the decade and the opportunities that that provides. Jane, would you like to come forward and ask your question? No, thank you very much, Anna, and thank you, uh, Lisa, for being with us today. Uh, we're now in the second year of the UN Decade of Healthy Aging, and it's certainly IFA's mandate and wish to see that adult immunisation and life course is pulled through the action areas. And I just wanted to get your views, you know, about that, knowing that, you know, the vaccine team at WHO does in fact connect with the ageing and life course. And what are the possibilities that you see in the future across these next nine years? Yeah, yeah thank you, Dr Barrett. And uh, I think it's uh, really um, useful to pinpoint these openings and opportunities for um, promoting and, and advocating for life course vaccination, um, for vaccination of adults, and that as, uh, you know, immunization is an entry point for um, healthy aging and, and the well-being of people ac across the life course. And, uh, and I think that um, we, we can use um, platforms for immunization and uh, as as ways to create those conversations, and I, I think it it often starts by um, looking across uh, the health system and the various uh, actors and and stakeholders who are engaged in health and vaccination and even primary care and, and service delivery, uh, and and all of those structures and organisations that are involved and their various activities. And, and being able to say, where can we weave in uh, a conversation or information about immunization and immunization for all ages? Mm. And, uh, and then really thinking about what it means at a practical level. And often that might mean um, working together with other local partners. So the IFA can work with other um, champions and actors in the immunization community. And there are many like, you know, um, and I, I guess it's very context specific in, in different countries and regions, but really thinking about who are the collaborators that you need to be working with who work in immunization at a national or a local level. So who are the collaborators and, and what are the connections into the health system? What's already happening and how to build on that? And, um, and lastly, I think, uh, you know, looking at um, the, the political context as well and, and where there are investments being made in improvements or extensions to health services where, where immunisation can be integrated and, and um, using that to... Um, really work together with all your local partners to advocate for those investments and actions. Look, thanks very much, Dr. Manning. Thank you, Anna. Not a problem. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Jane, for the question. Um, a little bit related to that, Lisa, again, I think the decade provides a great opportunity to kind of break down some of the siloed nature of, of a lot of the work we do in immunization. But I wonder kind of what are some of the strategies or what would you tell organizations that, you know, maybe aren't currently interested in immunization? How, how do you get people interested in and involved in this topic? Yeah, and, and I think that um, it's, it's a great question. And where do we start? And I think that there's just a few key points about immunization and the, the success of immunization just being such a, perhaps even the most effective um, preventive health intervention. And we can refer to the successes and the contributions of vaccination to disease elimination and eradication. And, you know, we, we've eradicated smallpox thanks to that vaccination. And 
uh, even for polio, we've made massive pro progress in um, reducing the, the number of cases of, of polio just like dramatically over the year. And there, there's data that, that we can further share that, that can um, be used to uh, substantiate some of these um, examples about the contributions of vaccination to um, disease, disease elimination, eradication, but health and well-being for our populations. And, um, you know, in, in the last 20 years, the, the um, child mortality has been dramatically reduced um, thanks to vaccination. And so I, I think that in um, speaking about vaccination, we can use data that, that demonstrates the disease reduction that we've seen um, and reduction in transmission, disease burden, et cetera. All of that data really speaks for itself. But at the same time, I think that in these conversations, also um, using narratives and, and personal stories and, and finding ways to, to also make this very human and, and relatable and, and talk about the way in, in which um, vaccination has, has contributed to advancing um, you know, longer lifespans, healthier lives, uh, lives and, and well-being. Um, that's really what it's about. So um, using these kind of uh, personal and human examples also help to, to bring it to life and make this much more compelling as well. Yeah, I think that's a certain uh, a, a great point to add, Lisa. And often, I think it's it's you can't rely too heavily on the science because I think it's not always approachable and accessible for for everybody. So I think that storytelling component is is crucial as well. Um, Lisa, I'm going to give you a few minutes, and I'm going to come back to you for some kind of key takeaways for our audience. But in the in the meantime, Luana, if you could throw up our slide, and I'll uh, let everybody know about our our presentation for next week. Next week, Global Cafe will be Professor Yun He Jun, and we will be talking about um, the need for person-centered care and care philosophy in the care of older persons. So really looking forward to next week's session and hoping you'll all be able to join us. Um, Lisa, thank you so much again for joining us today. We've, as always, quickly approached the hour. Um, but before we say goodbye, I'd love uh, to just hear some of your, what, what's the main message you want to leave with us today? Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, Anna. And thanks again for this wonderful opportunity. I've really appreciated this discussion. Uh, I would say um, a couple of main messages. Um, the first is to, to listen and look out for the opportunities and the entry points and to, to really see what the questions and concerns might be and who your collaborators can be, who you can be working with at a local level and uh, then identifying the, the ways in which we can be sharing information about vaccination and connecting um, communities and older adults and, and anyone across the life course, parents and children, um, and finding those entry points to connect people to vaccination. And, and so I, I think by just listening and, and working together and uh, also just ensuring that we're not relying on assumptions as well. And I would say that, uh, you know, I would um, keep an eye out for the forthcoming materials um, that will be published to, to support uh, the World Immunization Week campaign in the last week of April. I'd look out for those materials and just use that as a starting point for any of your local collaborations and activities. And, and hopefully there's some materials there that can give you a head start and be a foundation for um, uh, any of your work uh, at a local level. And, um, and, and I think that really um, immunization can be just a useful entry point for, for talking about health and aging and the well-being of people in our communities. And uh, I really welcome you to um, just take these opportunities and I know that we IFA, you're already doing such amazing work, and um, you know, I think, think through expanding the, these collaborations in in very local ways, we can um, just harness a lot of the the collective action to um, really close gaps uh, and and connect people to vaccination where it's really most needed as well. So um, yeah, thank you so much, Anna, again for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure to discuss and. Um, forward to to continued uh, collaboration in our work um, ahead as well so thank you
Thank you, Lisa. It's been an absolute pleasure. What a great discussion this morning. And thank you as always to our wonderful audience. We, uh, we very much look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks everybody. Have a great weekend. Mm -hmm.